It was December 2011 when a large black fly, a swarm of large black flies, reportedly started swarming the family's porch, coming back again and again, even after they were killed. There were instances where the kids inside the home, their eyes bulged, evil smiles crossed their faces, and their voices voices deepened every single time it happened. A seven-year-old in the home reportedly spoke to another child who nobody else could see. Dr. Jeffrey Anakuwu, the physician involved in this incident, told the Indianapolis Star, known as the Indy Star, I was scared myself when I walked into that room. Let me read from an official document. Medical staff reported that while the children were at their primary doctor's office, the medical staff reported they observed one of the children be lifted and thrown into the wall without anyone touching him. And that's when the Department of Child Services got involved. DCS case manager Valerie Washington entered the picture and reportedly saw much of the bizarre behavior for herself. Her own account of their interaction with the family included seeing the seven-year-old boy's eyes roll back into his head into his head and watching him growl. At one point, he spoke in a deep voice, an unrecognizable voice to his brother and said, it's time to die. I will kill you. That brings us to the pivotal point in the story. A claim that the boy literally walked up a wall. The DCS official, Washington, in her report, also shared that this account was backed by Willie Lee Walker, a registered nurse who was in the room when this happened. And here's what he had to say about this family. The the child became aggressive and walked up the wall as if he was walking on the floor and did a flip over the grandmother. This episode was also witnessed by the site counselor and the DCS worker. So in this DCS worker's report, she said, and the name was removed from this newspaper article and the story that Billy Hollowell details in his book, Playing With Fire. We'll talk about that in a second. So we're just going to call him Jimmy. Jimmy had a weird grin on his face and began to walk backwards while his grandmother was holding his hand. And while he walked up the wall backwards while holding his grandmother's hand, never he never let go of it. He flipped over and landed on his feet in front of the grandmother and sat down in the chair. A few minutes later, he looked up as if he was back to himself. The report states that Washington and at least one other professional left the room immediately to report what had unfolded to a doctor, but the doctor didn't believe it. The physician went into the room and asked the boy to walk up the wall again, but the child said this was not something that he could do, and he was unable to replicate the act because he was all of a sudden back to himself. But from growling and and rage on the part of one of the children and the need for multiple people to get involved to try to stop the boy... Here are some other additional details that are are disturbing. Miss Ammons, the mother, was discussing the event that led her family to the hospital that evening in the first place. While at home, she was discussing with her seven-year-old about some of the churches that she was visiting, and anytime she began talking about church, this kid began to growl, and he ended up attacking. The more she talked about church and getting help on the phone with somebody, he attacked his brother, put both hands around his brother's neck, and tried to try to kill him. This chaos led child services to step in and remove the children from the home until they could assess all the events that were unfolding. A period that lasted about six months. 
So then the police were called, and the police entered this, this story. Specifically, Gary, in Indiana, police captain Charles Austin told the Indy Star that when he first heard about all this, he was skeptical of the mother's story. But after spending time at the Ammons home and interviewing the people involved, he said he was, quote, a believer. Austin had a variety of his own claims about the home, including seeing strange silhouettes in photos taken on his iPhone and observing the driver's seat in his car moving forward and backward on its own, among other things. But it's his claim about what happened one day after he left the Ammons home that is perhaps the most disturbing. Austin told the Daily Mail that while he was at a gas station, the radio in his police car started operating on its own. Here's his own words. I had my police radio, my squad car dash AFM radio, my police cell, and my iPhone. I was looking at the pictures on my phone that I had taken with my iPhone when I, 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 I made a call on the radio, but all of a sudden, a growling voice came through the speakers on the AM, FM radio. And that voice said, you out of here. And there was a lot of garbled, a lot of static. And then it was gone. So I don't have time to go into the rest of the story. You can read about it in the book, Playing With Fire, the inspiration for the series. Written by a friend of mine, Billy Hallowell, who was on Revival Town Podcast. You can go back to, to season one and listen to this episode for yourself as he talks a little bit about this book. In fact, Andy and I invited him back onto the podcast, and we're going to interview him again in a couple weeks for a special Halloween episode of Revival Town Podcast, where he's going to share some of the details and stories surrounding this. And the reason we have chosen to do a series and to talk about the supernatural because there seems to be a lot of fascination in pop culture with all things supernatural. So I just want to begin today by asking you a question. Do you believe the account in the Word of God that says there is an unseen realm that we cannot see with our physical eyes. How many believe that? You believe the word. Or if you raise your hand, you believe the word. Those of you that are home, watch the live stream, do you believe the word? So we're, if you do, let's go to the word and let's find out if something like this can happen. Well, we see throughout the Gospels that, de that Jesus encountered demons on more than one occasion. So we're going to read this account from Mark chapter 5, verse 1. So they arrived at the other side of the lake. And when it means they, it means Jesus and his disciples. They're in the region of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with the chain. Whenever he, put, whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and he smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with the sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him and ran to meet him and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of him. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for there are many inside of me. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send him to some distant place. Why? Because they always, they want to inhabit. That's what you see when you look at scripture, demons, demonic spirits, they want to inhabit, whether it's people or animals, they want to inhabit. So there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. Now, notice who has the authority, right? Jesus has the authority. The evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the hillside. Another translation says off the cliff, into the water, and they drowned. What's to, for me, 
the most fascinating part of this story is that all of the demons from one man killed 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of demons. And that's a lot of torment. And before I go any further, I, 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 want, I want to say this. The reason I shared the account, the real-life account encounter in Gary, Indiana, that was published in the Indy Star. And, and the reason I'm reading this portion of Scripture about the demon-possessed man is not to, to scare anybody, but to remind you that, number one, this is real, and number two, we win. You don't have to live in fear. Now, you can't, there are people that have an unhealthy interest in the demonic realm, which we're going to get to next week. We're going to talk about trespassing next week and what gives the enemy the right to attack you. And then in week four, we're going to talk about the freedom that we have in Jesus. But just know this, the enemy is afraid of you. If you're a believer, he's going to do everything he can to stop you because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, the same spirit that defeated the devil, lives inside of you. Amen? So you don't have to be afraid. There is power. We sang about it this morning. There is power in the name of Jesus. Just tap somebody and tell them that. There's power in the name of Jesus. Tell somebody that. Dr. Michael Brown said, the Bible tells us that we're in a battle with Satan himself. The Bible tells us that we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but with demonic powers operating in a systematic, coordinated way. So he says to be sober-minded, which is a description I'm going to read to you in just a second. 1 Peter 5, 8 says to be alert, to be sober-minded. Dr. Michael Brown says to be sober-minded means to recognize the reality of the spiritual realm. So let me ask you again, how many believe that there really is a spiritual realm, right? So we've got to recognize it. 1 Peter 5, 8 says stay alert. Now, the other translations say, be sober-minded. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil, because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says we're not unaware of his schemes. Ephesians 6, I read this at the close last week. I'll read it right now. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on all of God's armor, on all of God's armor. Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. And by the way, the number one strategy of the devil is deception. This is why people don't believe in God. The reason people identify as atheist or agnostic is because Satan has blinded them. That's what the scripture tells us. He is a very real devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we need to be aware of his strategies, which is to blind minds, right? to get people to turn from the word, to deceive. He deceived Adam and Eve in the garden at the very beginning. He's been doing it ever since. And if he can't deceive you, he'll try to distract you. He'll try to get you so busy that before you know it, you're away from God. But we're aware of his strategies, aren't we? Billy Hallowell said this, Scripture makes it clear that there is a spiritual battle between good and evil that has been raging beneath our material surface since Satan's fall. This is why Ephesians 6 says this in verse 12, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the what kind of world? Unseen. Everybody say unseen. All right, this is the Word of God. There is an unseen world. This is why I read from Daniel 10 last week when an angel showed up to deliver a message, an answered prayer to Daniel after three weeks in response to Daniel's words. And he said he would have been there sooner with the answer, with the message, but he was doing battle in a heavenly realm. And Michael the archangel had to assist him. This means there is an unseen world in the heavenlies. But guess what? There's also powers at work. It says, in this dark world on planet earth. And, and there are evil spirits in the heavenly places. And this is why it says you got to put on the armor of God so that you can resist. And when the battle's over, you'll still be standing. I believe everyone in this room and everybody watching our live stream today, whatever battle you're facing, you're going to remain standing because your faith is in Jesus, the very one who already conquered the devil. And the devil 
until the day he is cast into the lake of fire, he will continue to steal, to kill, and destroy. This is why Scripture after Scripture says to be on guard, to watch out, to be alert, to be sober-minded. That's why we're doing the series, to educate you on a very real enemy, but to remind you that you have more power and authority than that enemy. So where does the devil come from? I'm so glad you asked. All right? I almost said Washington, D.C. But I didn't. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm not going to get political on you. And I'll just throw this out. It. If everybody you work with knows your political affiliation, but they don't know you're a Christian, there's something wrong. Okay, now we're getting quiet. All right. I don't like him. <laughs> Where'd the devil come from? He was created by God. His name was Lucifer, and he was an angelic being. Ezekiel 28, I don't have time to read it. You can read it later. But in Ezekiel chapter 28, we'll find out that he was a blameless guardian cherub created by God for the purpose of glorifying God and serving God. He was involved with music and worship, but pride filled his heart because of his beauty, which was God created, but he fell in love with himself. You know anybody like that? Don't raise your hand. And he was banished in disgrace. He sinned, he was banished, and then he was expelled from heaven. Isaiah chapter 14 confirms that he was thrown out of heaven. He said this, I will be like the most high God. That's what the devil said. I will be like the most high God. And God said, nope, and threw him out, right? So then people ask, well, what, what, where do demons come from? What, what about demons? Now, Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4 tell us that a third of the angels in heaven rebelled with Lucifer, and they also were expelled from heaven. Let me read Revelation chapter 12. Take a look here. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels, so it's calling these demons angels. His angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the aged serpent, called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to earth with all the angels. All right? And there's also scripture in the Old Testament, all right, where these fallen angels hooked up with the sons of God, right, with human women, and these women gave birth to call the Nephilim. That's a whole nother conversation for another time. But we know this, pride caused all of it. Pride is the source of all things demonic. In fact, here's what St. Augustine said, one of my favorite quotes, pride is the mother of all the sins that is pregnant with all the other sins. This is a good opportunity for us today to examine our heart, to make sure that we don't have pride in it. And you might be sitting here today and watching today, and you might be thinking, well, you know what? I'm not someone who brags, and I'm not arrogant. Did you know that if you blatantly disobey God and rebel against him, that means if you, well, you know what? I, don't, I know the word says that, but it's really not that bad. I'm going to do it anyway. That is pride. And that births other things, and it just gets us down the slope that we don't want to go to. So tap somebody and say, guard your heart, right? I got to guard my heart. Point at me. Everybody say, preacher, guard your heart. Whoa, easy. Easy, right? All right, so that we know where the devil comes from. We know where demons come from. So what's the devil's purpose? Billy Hallowell says that the Bible tells us that Satan is a deceiver and a liar who routinely authors sparks and perpetuates confusion. All right, we know that the devil is an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion. I read that first Peter 5 8. He hatches schemes, Ephesians 6 11. He is a tempter, Matthew chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Satan is, quote, the, the prince of this world, John 12, verse 31. The devil is a deceiver who has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I mentioned that, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He is at work in those who are disobedient. Ephesians 2.2, 2, he's always behind our sin. Satan is also an accuser. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. 
In Jesus, there's no condemnation. Amen? We have to remember that. So if we're weighed down by guilt and shame and condemnation, I just want you to know that's coming from the accuser. That's not coming from God. God is here to love you no matter how many times you rebelled against him, and he's here to open his arms and welcome you back. We'll get things right today. Amen? The devil uses demons. The devil uses people through demonic possession. He uses people through demonic influence. He uses false prophets, false apostles, false teachers, false Christians. He tempts us and tries to get us to give in to our, our sinful nature and our flesh. And because he is a created being, he doesn't have the same attributes that God has. In other words, Satan is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at once. God is everywhere. Amen? Satan cannot be, he's not omniscient. In other words, he doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything. He's not all-knowing. God is. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. God is all-powerful. And you are more powerful because of Jesus than the enemy. This is why the scripture says, greater is he who is inside of you than he who's in the world. Well, who's in the world? The devil. Let's expose some myths, and then we'll let you go. Four myths about the devil and demons. Four myths. Four misconceptions about the devil and demons. Number one, the first misconception is that the devil lives in hell, right? Hollywood thinks he lives in hell. The devil does not live in hell. He comes out of hell, and he wreaks havoc. Or in cartoons, you see him in a little red suit with a pointy tail and a pitchfork, right? And there are people, and there are Christians, and maybe you came in today thinking the devil's in hell. Again, this is why we're doing this series, not to make you feel bad, but to educate you on what the Word of God says. The devil is not in hell. Job 1.7 says this. God was having a conversation with Satan. Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling, what? The, the where? The earth. I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. One more time, 1 Peter 5, 8, watch out, your adversary, the devil, he prowls around, where? Prowls around this earth looking for people to devour. In fact, John 10, 10 says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. It comes where? Earth. He was kicked out of heaven. He's on this earth. Now, I do want you to know, someday, in the future, God is probably going to crank up the song by Striper to hell with the devil. And he is going to send the devil to hell. And hell is going to get cast into a lake of fire. Hell was created for the devil. That's what scripture tells us. All right. And people send themselves there with, with the devil someday by rejecting the free gift of salvation. So let's not reject that gift. Let's embrace it. Amen. Amen. So the devil, we know he's not in hell. He's, he's roaming this earth. Why do you think there's so much evil and wickedness? Because him and his cohorts are out wreaking havoc. This is why sometimes, have you ever read a headline and it was so bad that you didn't even want to read the article? It was so bad, right? Whether it, it was about a, a rape or a, a murder of an innocent child or some heinous act that should have never been done. Those aren't the doings of God. They're a result of free will because Adam and Eve allowed themselves to be deceived way back in Genesis. Someday, God is going to right every wrong. We're going to be with him forever. But while we're here on earth, we have to be smart. And we have to guard ourselves. And don't get so into pop culture where you're going to invite demonic stuff into your house. We're called to be separate, to live different, amen? All right, number two, myth number two, misconception number two. Christians can't have demons, all right, inside them. Christians can't have demons, right? Christians can't have demons. They can't be possessed, all right? They can't be possessed, but Dr. Jeremiah says this, spirits do not have physical bodies, but they can inhabit a body, and it's possible for multiple spirits to possess the same body, all right? Just because the Holy Spirit lives in our house, our body, the temple, doesn't mean that they can't trespass. And next week, we're going to go through in detail some things that allow the enemy to trespass. 
And even though he can trespass us, if we have been bought with the blood of Jesus, then we cannot be owned by the devil. We can't be possessed by the devil. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says that our body is the temple. Romans 8, 11 says the same spirit lives in us. John 14, 16, God said that he would, Jesus said that he was going to send an advocate, the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. So today, this message is not to make you afraid of the devil. The devil's afraid of you. But it's to say, be on guard. Myth number three. Only those with special gifting can cast out demons, right? Some people think that only a pastor can cast out a demon. And some people don't even think a pastor can cast them out. They think they got to get a priest. The priest's got to get a cross. I want you to know a demon's not afraid of a cross. He's afraid of the blood. It's the blood of Jesus. It's not the cross that did it. It's the blood of Jesus. That's, if Jesus died on the cross, but without the shedding of blood, the Scripture says, there is no remission of sins. Without the blood, it's the blood. Everybody say the blood of Jesus. All right? The blood of Jesus. And anyone that is a follower of Jesus has the authority to cast out demons. Matthew chapter 28 confirms this. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18 says, go into all the world. This is for every disciple of Jesus, every follower of Jesus. Go into the world, preach the gospel, cast out demons in my name. The devil and the demons tremble at the name of Jesus. There's something about that name. That name in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Only the name of Jesus. There is no other name. So we got to be careful how we use that name. You see, there's no power in the name of Buddha. Demons don't flee. Get out in the name of Buddha, right? Get out in the name of Christian Muhammad Allah. Hut, 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 hike. <laughs> no, only the name of Jesus. Tap somebody say, only Jesus. There's no other name that's even attacked. You've never watched one movie where another name was taken in vain. Only the name of Jesus. Why? Because there's power in that name. As we close, number four, our, our last misconception, last myth, that freedom is automatic once the demons are evicted. And some people believe that once, yeah, man, once, once those demons are cast out, then you never have to worry again. But here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. Or basically, uh-oh. And they all enter the person and live there. Somebody say, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> and so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. All right. We're going to close. I'll have the team come back up right now. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. But I, I want to I, I ask you this. How many have known somebody, and maybe you've experienced but have you ever known somebody that was bound by addiction, they got clean, and then they went back into it, and they were worse than they'd ever been before? This is why we have to stay on guard. So next week, again, we're going to give some examples of things that we do that allow the enemy to trespass. Things that give him permission to attack us and attack our families. So we want to be sober-minded. We want to be alert to the devil's schemes, to his strategies. I don't know who said this, but I've heard it multiple times. And it's worth repeating. Part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time devils. You're either in or you're out. And if you're only halfway in, you're, you're going to get tacked. I mean, you, you might not have demonic spirits in your house and things walking up your walls, all right? But your life can unravel pretty quickly. So we want, we want to be on guard.
So I'm going to have you stand. We're going to, we're going to pray. Before I pray, we're, we're going to sing this chorus one more time, Break Every Chain. Because God is here today to break cha- chains. Whatever, whatever, whatever you're bound with, sin. I mean, it's interesting, too, how many times when Jesus would heal somebody, he would first cast out a spirit. I think there's some connections, not to every sickness and disease, but I do think there's a connection with demonic spirits and sickness and disease and habits and addictions. So, so today we're going to pray. And um, I'm not going to have you raise your hand today, but here's what I want to ask you. If, if you have, you know, you might be standing here today and thinking, you know what, man, I haven't, I haven't played with a Ouija board. Um, I haven't, uh, man, I haven't been watching any horror movies. But maybe you've blatantly disobeyed God this week. We're, you're about to do something. The Holy Spirit was waving that flag like, don't do it. And then you did it anyway. You know, like in the cartoon, you got the devil on one side and the angel on the other side. And then you gave in. Now, don't, don't, don't feel shame today. Just give that to God. God. God's here to break every chain, to forgive every sin. Amen? Amen. No condemnation. Look at someone next to you say there's no condemnation. All right, let's sing this chorus, and then I'm going to pray, and then Pastor Corey will dismiss you. Oh, I hear those chains falling. Oh, I hear those chains falling, yeah. Oh, I hear those chains falling. Oh, I hear those chains falling. Cause there is power in the name of Jesus. chain, break every chain. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To do what? Father, we come before you today, and I just thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for penetrating every single heart. We thank you, God, that the same spirit you used to raise Jesus from the dead is inside of us right now. So we take authority over the enemy who has attacked families, individuals, homes. God, people in this room, people watching our live stream. God, we take authority over the enemy in the name of Jesus, that name that is above every name. We command the enemy to let go of God's people in Jesus' name. And Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our rebellion, forgive us for allowing pride in our heart. Today, we thank you that when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we thank you that we stand stand here today forgiven, And not only forgiven, but free. Because whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen.